Hello, I'm Tom Harpin in Washington, D.C., and here's what's coming up tonight on The Big Picture. Turns out progressives and neo-Nazis agree on something. They both think Donald Trump is the new Hitler. But is all this Trump is a Nazi talk just hyperbole? We'll find out in just a moment. And Senate Republicans silenced Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren last night after she read a letter from civil rights icon Coretta Scott King that essentially called Jeff Sessions a racist. They say she impugned the dignity of a colleague. When did Republicans become such precious little snowflakes? That and more in tonight's Lone Liberal Rumble. This. Donald Trump is the president of the United States, but if you spend any time at all on the internet reading liberal blogs or any time watching progressive TV shows like this one, you may have heard him described as the second coming of, well, pretty much every dictator ever, even fictional ones like Lord Voldemort from the Harry Potter books. Adam Johnson from Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting has done the legwork and found that Donald Trump has been compared to, at a minimum, Ayatollah Khomeini, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Saddam Hussein, Fidel Castro, and Kim Jong-il. Those comparisons made some buzz in media circles, but if any Trump dictator comparison has really captivated the public as a whole, it's the comparison of Trump to Adolf Hitler. Go to an anti-Trump protest and you'll see hundreds, if not thousands, of signs calling him a fascist, the Fuhrer, and a Nazi. Even real American Nazis think Trump is a Nazi. For example, when neo-Nazi leader Richard Spencer opened a recent speech with a cry of, Hail Trump, he was greeted with a flurry of enthusiastic Nazi salutes. Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! <laughs> Meanwhile, history books about the Nazis, World War II, and totalitarianism are flying off the shelves. People are really, honestly, genuinely concerned about our democratic republic becoming a totalitarian state, specifically a fascist totalitarian state under the rule of Donald Trump. On the one hand, this idea that Trump is Hitler seems pretty ridiculous. After all, just 10 years ago, liberals everywhere were calling George W. Bush Hitler, and he was gone within the year. Yes, Bush gave us the Patriot Act, an illegal war in Iraq, and an immensely more powerful deep state, but he also handed his office over to Barack Obama, like every other U.S. president has handed over power to his successor, peacefully. Donald Trump will, in all likelihood, leave power after his term in office in the exact same way. But then again, there is something different about Trump. His naked appeals to white supremacy, his demonization of minority groups, and the way he glorifies autocracy for its own sake. They're like nothing we've seen before at the presidential level in American politics, at least not recently and at least not at this high a level. So what's actually going on here? Is Trump Hitler or is he just another right-wing Republican? Let's ask Ron Rosenbaum, contributor to Slate, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and the author of several books, included, including Explaining Hitler, the search for the origins of his evil. Ron Rosenbaum, welcome to the program. Glad to be here. Great to have you with us. So you just came out with a new piece in the LA Review of Books titled Against Normalization, the Lesson of the Munich Post about the Trump-Hitler comparison. And you say right at the beginning of it that you resisted even talking or making it, talking about or making this comparison until now. Why and why now are you changing your mind about that? Well, my comparison is still kind of narrow. Uh, I first discovered the leading anti-Hitler newspaper in Munich. I was fascinated by the Munich Hitler, which is less studied because uh, he's not the genocidal Hitler. He was the Hitler who was running for office. Uh, and was he evil then? When did he become evil? Uh, how did he fool people if he did? Um, and uh, I found in a basement archive uh, a cache of all the 12 years of the issues of the one leading anti-Hitler newspaper. So I was able to follow the story of their investigation of Hitler. And I think the, uh, so my comparison in some way is limited to the press reaction uh, to the rise of both Trump and Hitler. And I have to say I'm more optimistic in a way 
than I was for a while because I see that the press has not backed down despite uh, Trump's minions saying things like uh, keep your mouth shut. Yeah, although we're only three weeks into it. Tell us the story of the Munich Post, the newspaper that's the source of the title for your piece. What, what does its story tell us about the rise of fascism and what warnings does it hold for us in the age of Trump? Well, they almost alone among media in Germany uh, con started to investigate Hitler in 1921 and kept it up through uh, the time they were shut down in, uh, after Hitler took power in 33. And they found out a lot about him. They found out in 1931 uh, a paper that planned the final solution, used the word Entlossung, which is German for final solution, for the first time. Uh, so uh, they always seemed to believe there was something more sinister to Hitler than the normal politician. That's remarkable. So is, is Trump, in your view, a fascist? Or is that term too historically specific to have any meaning here? People ask me that a lot. I don't think Trump has an ideology the way Hitler did. I think of Trump as an evil clown. That's my preferred term. And uh, a bumbling fool, a buffoon, uh, who can do immense damage to American institutions and American values but more through bull in a china shop crashing around ego vainglorious uh, uh, self-aggrandizing than uh, through the deeply sinister uh, anti-Jewish racist ideology of Hitler. What about the uh, neo-president or co-president or I, I think we haven't come yet to a term although you know, he's on the front cover of Time magazine next week, uh, Steve Bannon, is, or, or some of the other people that Trump has surrounded himself with. Do they concern you? Well, I think that's, that's very true. That's the most disturbing uh, aspect of Trump's rise, is that he has brought, crawling out of the woodwork, these neo-fascist, alt-right, neo-Nazi, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and uh, I was shocked when uh, I would read about how uh, Jewish journalists were attacked with uh, images of the ovens in Auschwitz. And I myself have gotten tweets that read, uh, I gas Jews. Um, and I don't believe uh, this kind of thing w uh, got out of the shadows until Trump and his followers mainstreamed racial hatred. Yeah. If Trump isn't a fascist, is he at least an autocrat, distinct from what we've normally come to expect from Republicans? Or is he the logical continuation of the Republican Party's lurch toward the far right, funded so well by these petrobillionaires and others? I think both aspects are true. I think in some way the best comparison so far is to uh, Pinochet in Chile, who came to power through blood but uh, reigned as an autocrat, killed dissidents, jailed them, dropped them from airplanes. Uh, Trump hasn't done that yet, but Pinochet was more, again, a uh, uh, figurehead for the deep state of military and uh, um, uh, market economy uh, fascists than um, uh, a Hitlerite, I think. Yeah, I've, I've been reading uh, Fritz Tyson's uh, I Funded Hitler, which is out of print. It's, it's like it's pretty hard to find, but it's an amazing book um, that uh, from the point of view of one of the wealthiest men in Germany who was the major funder, major industrialist, the major funder of Hitler, and how long it took him to realize what was going on. Do you, do you, do you see something like that happening with the people who have brought Trump to power? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether it's a technological thing or not, but uh, back in the 20s and the early 30s, uh, communications were far more primitive. Uh, and so uh, I don't know whether you blame the German people for not knowing. I, I think they knew 
but they did nothing. Um, but they weren't in touch with the, with each other the way we are with Twitter, say. And uh, the most heartening thing to me was the way people immediately ran to the airports uh, after they heard about Trump's uh, immigration ban. Um, and it was all through digital uh, communication. And so um, uh, I, I feel that uh, resistance is more possible now mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then it certainly then the German people had didn't have the structures of resistance right. that we do. Ron, we just have a minute left. Um, uh, Ajit Pai is uh, Trump's uh, guy to head the FCC and he's basically coming out against net neutrality. Um, if we see the internet turning into a, uh, a corporatist version of the Chinese internet, a heavily censored internet, would that give you pause? Definitely. I think that's a real danger. I think that would be a signal that things have uh, taken a, ter a real turn for the worse because it will disconnect people from each other. Yeah, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, th thoughts on resistance very quickly? Well, I think so far it's been spontaneous, which has been good. You know, you haven't, uh, uh, there's no key leadership that's emerged, but you had the Million Women March, which again was, uh, you know, shockingly great, I mm -hmm. thought. Um, yeah. And, uh, and the, the airports and uh, growing groups of people. I met with uh, some media people last night who were talking about what could be done. Um, so uh, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm completely hopeless. Yeah, I, well, the hopelessness is not a place that any of us should be going, I think. Ron Rosenbaum, I really appreciate your perspective. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me on. Coming up, Republicans say they only want to stop illegal immigration, but the truth is that they want to slow down or stop entirely legal immigration as well. Is this part of a plot to make America white again? We'll find out in tonight's Lone Liberal Rumble right after the break. Feeling of freedom. Everyone in the world should experience freedom, and you get it on the open road. The world according to Jesse. Welcome to my world. Come along for the ride. Our culture is awash in lies dominated by streams of never-ending electronic hallucinations that merge fact and fiction until they are indistinguishable. We have become the most illusioned society on Earth. Politics is a species of endless and meaningless political theater. Politicians have morphed into celebrities. Our two ruling parties are in reality one party, the corporate party. And those who attempt to puncture this vast, breathless universe of fake news designed to push through the cruelty and exploitation of the neoliberal order are pushed so far to the margins of society, including by a public broadcasting system that has sold its soul for corporate money, that we might as well be mice squeaking against an avalanche. But squeak we must. Hey! Just sending a friendly reminder to celebrate Black History Month. Although under this administration, honoring the achievements of famous blacks will be considered a success if Trump doesn't use the word the in front of blacks. And here's another friendly reminder to watch Redacted Tonight every Friday at 8 p.m. on RT America and on youtube.com slash Redacted Tonight. Keep fighting. Welcome back to the big picture. Stopping illegal or more appropriately undocumented immigration was one of the big three messages of Donald Trump's presidential campaign. But so was stopping legal immigration. 
And now Trump's fellow Republicans are making good on his promises. On Tuesday, two leading Republican senators, Georgia Senator David Perdue and Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton, introduced a bill they said would cut legal immigration to the United States by a whopping half. It would do this by limiting green cards, slashing away at the number of refugees that are legally allowed to flee to America, and ending a lottery system that brings in migrants from countries underrepresented in our nation as a whole. Cotton defended the plan Tuesday night on Fox so-called news, saying it was all about defending blue-collar workers. Right now we have a legal immigration system that is not working for American workers. Blue-collar workers, people who work with their hands on their feet, have seen their wages stagnate for decades. At the same time, we've seen record levels of immigration in recent decades. Cotton is a smart politician who knows how to say the right things to make Fox happy, but he's not telling the truth about this. His bill is not about protecting workers and raising wages. It's about something else altogether, something so ugly that Cotton wouldn't even say it on Fox so-called news. It's about making America white again. Think of it this way. If Cotton and Purdue really cared about wages and workers, they'd raise the minimum wage so it matched up with productivity, around 19 bucks an hour. And they'd pass card check legislation to make it easier for workers to form unions and thus collectively bargain for higher wages. But that's not what they're doing. They're trying to cut immigration. And they're trying to cut immigration because immigrants to the United States these days are way less white than they used to be. Until the 1960s, we limited immigration on the basis of how many people whose ancestors were from any particular country were already here in the United States. Since most Americans in the first half of the last century were white, this was a slick way to keep people who weren't white out of our country. That all changed in 1965 when President Johnson signed the Immigration and Nationality Act in 1965, blowing apart the old quota system and ushering in a new era of immigration from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Johnson's move was as revolutionary an act as the Voting Rights Act, which conservatives also hate, and they have never really gotten over it. For example, Pat Buchanan, the godfather of Trumpism, even went so far as to blame the Immigration Act of 1965 for the 2007 Virginia Tech massacre because the gunman was Korean. As Buchanan wrote, Cho, as the gunman, was among the 864,000 Koreans here as a result of the Immigration Act of 1965, which threw the nation's doors open to the greatest invasion in history. What happened in Blacksburg cannot be divorced from what's been happening to America since the Immigration Act brought tens of millions of strangers to these shores. That would be strangers of color if you've never read Buchanan. As ugly as that sentiment is, it's swarming right below the surface of the entire Republican Party's anti-immigration rhetoric. The simple reality, as Buchanan would point out, is that they want to make America white again. But they just don't have the guts to say it. Let's rumble. With me for tonight's Lone Liberal Rumble are Alex Pfeiffer, reporter for The Daily Caller, and Charles Sauer, economist and president of the Market Institute. Thanks, guys, for being with me tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, why don't you just admit that, you know, what this is all about is making America white well, again. I don't get why you have to jump to that point. I mean, what he's saying, it's not, what he's saying about... Uh, he wants to cut in half it, the people of color yeah, coming to this country. what he's saying about that hurting wages isn't a lie. You know, the Center for Immigration Studies came out uh, with a recent study that showed in the past 20 years as immigration has been booming, uh, low-skilled... Uh, native, Amer native meaning they were born here, have been leaving the workforce, while high-skilled uh, Amer uh, Americans born here, uh, Native Americans, have been staying uh, in the workforce. So we right now have 42 million uh, immigrants in the U.S. We're a couple years from having the, you know, the highest percentage of immigrants in American history. I don't see what we have to bring. Immigrants of color. You keep bringing, I mean, yes, yeah, sure, that's, yes, the world is less white. No, I've, so I've read Pat Buchanan's book. By I have, definition, I, when we bring in immigrants, I've had this, white. I've had these conversations with Pat Buchanan are, himself. Immigrants are hurting, you know, low-skilled American workers. So well, I don't I think, think you can, that you can make a case. Baloney, I think you can make an, a case. He's uh, helping. I, I think you can make a case that 11 million people, undocumented workers in this country, are driving down wages in certain industries. I mean, you know, in, in, in before, before 86, when Reagan stopped enforcing the employer Man, the employer, uh, the law against employing people who were not in the country illegally. Prior to 86, if, if a wealthy white employer hired a bunch of people who were in this country uh, illegally, they could get fined or go to jail. 
Reagan stopped that, and nobody's been enforcing it ever since. And, course, and, and so you saw the meatpacking industry that was entirely unionized. There's not a union in sight. You saw the construction industries that were entirely unionized. There's not a union in sight. And, and so I, you, know, I, you can build that case, but that, that's almost entirely non-documented labor. In fact, they're, they're publishing newspapers on the, just over the border in Mexico with help wanted ads for meatpacking plants in Minnesota. Well, Look, this Alex, is a... Uh, excuse this, me, Charles? You're, it's interesting the way that you debate this because you're missing what the union argument was, which has always been to stop these immigrants and stop the people from taking their jobs. And the fact is, is that is the wrong policy. Hey, the policy hey, that Charles, you talked about is the wrong policy. Charles, the unions in the, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s in the United States were the great bulwark against people of color coming into the workplace, including indigenous people of color, including African Americans and Native Americans and uh, people who, who have been here as long as white people have. Yep. And, and, and uh, you know, so you can't say that race is not a piece of this. But well, no, union, the way that the, the union supported this was a problem, but Republicans supporting this is a problem too, and it's because the it's based on a static view of the economy. It's the same view that the left has of, of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. Does when you have a correlation, it, no, Charles. when you have a static view of the economy, <laughs> when you only take a snapshot and look at things, you come to these wrong conclusions. The fact is, is we do want people coming into our workforce, but we don't want your high regulatory, high bar uh, employment rules to make it harder for people to create jobs. We want people to come into this country because they want to work and we want to be able to create jobs for them. The more people that but we have ask, working, if you the ask faster Cotton, the economy grows. If you ask Senators Cotton and Purdue, they don't want people Or the unions country. or the other people on the left, they don't want I, people in this country. It's funny you're agreeing with the Chamber of Commerce here. I mean, the rich Republican donors love, you know, massive amounts of legal immigration because it it's low skilled labor. It's so do a you million not people a year is not massive amount. Yes, it is. We have 42 million right it, now. It is. Uh, you know, gonna, it, 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 it's it's not altering our population profile that much. You know, the, it is hurting low skilled fertility you, in the United States. Does it not is, hurt the job chances know, of American has, workers? Has dropped, does but, it not hurt the job chances of American citizens bringing in a million immigrants a year? I don't believe so. I really don't. That's I, almost I, the total amount of jobs that uh, it not. I think that's half of the amount of the total jobs that Trump created in his administration. I mean, you mean Obama? That, was the, uh, that the Obama number, created the number, in the number his was 13 million that were created during the Obama it, administration. And it should have been 26 million under any other Third, president through history, going back to what, the 1930s. Well, it not, would have now been, we're wandering into a discussion of Republican obstruction. So 13 million jobs were created and 8 million immigrants came in. You know, instead, 13 million Americans could have gotten jobs. And it, also, it's going to be 500,000. It's not like there's going to be, you know, don't worry, America's still not going to be white. Okay, even the Center for Immigration Studies also did another study. If we cut off immigration in 2060, whites will still become a minority. So unless, you know, Tom Cotton also plans on putting commercials in Montana telling people have six kids each, I think America's still going to become non-white. They're doing that. It's called the anti, it's called the, uh, the forced pregnancy movement, you know, it's sometimes referred to as the right to life movement. Oh my God, we can't have white people getting abortions. Anyway, uh, let me move on. <laughs> you guys are like, what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, actually, I'm not, because I, I, you know, I really believe I know that. Actually, I, you know, is, uh, you get the I, I get the tweets like from these Russia white nationalists. They have a, 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 a advertisements yeah. encouraging people to have kids. Well, yeah. there's there's several countries that are encouraging people to have kids because you know Japan is aggressively encouraging people to have kids because they have a low birth rate. And they have a pro instead of, so, are they racist for not wanting people? To I, come no, through? I think it's a different. Right. I think it, well, I, I think you could make that case for Japan. I don't. Uh, frankly, I don't know about Russia, but. In any case, the confrontation last night between Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren and Senate Republicans was one for the history books, at least if the history books want to focus on Republicans turning into precious little snowflakes. When Warren took the floor to read from a 1986 letter written by Coretta Scott King detailing the racism of Attorney General-designate and current Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions, Mitch McConnell used an obscure rule to science her and silence her and rule her out of order. The stated justification for this rule was that Warren was unbecomingly impugning a colleague, that would be Jeff Sessions, although it's hard to see how the words of a civil rights icon could be, could be un unbecoming. So when did Republicans become such sensitive snowflakes? And this, why are they scared of Coretta Scott This isn't obscure. This was just talked about during the... Uh 
during the confirmation hearings for session. So if you call two weeks ago being discussed obscure, then we have a different definition of obscure. But look, in the Senate, it's like a street fight. They only have a very few rules, and one of those rules is not to impugn your colleagues on the Senate floor. If you want to talk about snowflakes, we can go back to the leadership of Senator Reid and what he did by filling the tree. And now what when we want to start talking about being You're obscure. You're change the subject on me, Charles. No, Senator Reid. I mean, Reed this is the simple fact that the majority last, leader, last night Chuck Senator Schumer Reed tweeted. Filled the, filled the last, tree as the majority leader for years has, on end. Which has nothing to do with this discussion. Republicans from being able to have last, a vote last on night. Anything. After after this happened, Chuck Schumer sent out an email to every to all reporters. I, I get it, and it was a list of all the times Republicans have gone on the floor of the Senate and trashed their Republican colleagues in ways that were far worse than what Elizabeth Warren said, and and you know Mitch McConnell never said a word. This is if, rank hypocrisy. If Republicans out. were scared of Credit Scott King, uh, Scott King, uh, the McConnell shouldn't have shut up uh, Warren. I mean, she's been on TV all day today. Uh, her, I think five million people watched her Facebook Live video. So you think uh, McConnell was trying to help Warren? He's well, trying that's to hurt actually like session? that's that's one theory I read online. I don't know if that's actually true, but if they actually are scared of Scratch Cocking, uh, they shouldn't have done this. They should have let her talk, and no one would have even known. Uh, really about the letter she well, said. Strategically, you're right. Yes. So, so you know. So I don't, I don't really know why they did it. It worked out strategically for her. Her publisher mentioned on Tuesday night uh, that she's going to be writing a book. So it's definitely been a great thing uh, for Warren. I have a feeling the title of the book is going to be. She like, perceived. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and 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 then and then you get um, uh, the senator from Texas, uh, John Cornyn, today said, "I hope the little lady feels chastened." I mean, what is going on with the Republicans in the United States Senate? The Senate is a is an interesting place, but it's something that we need to the not little lady being chastened. It's something that we need to not just attack and focus on when it's your side that's getting attacked. We need to focus on it when the Senate isn't allowing the the minority uh, to have a voice and so which is what's uh, where, happening where, right now where i do agree here is that this was the minority having a voice and i think she should have been able to talk if not just for yeah, the uh talk. press part alone yeah. but again there's not many rules in the senate we have a consensus actually well okay alex pfeiffer charles sauer thank you, you guys thank you, thank you both